Um, this is a re-recording of what we covered in class on Monday, um, October 17th. So we had some power outages going on in the class at, on that date. Um, and it caused Canvas to go down, um, everything to just shut off. Um, and one, I don't think I had hit record at the beginning of the lecture. So I was gonna have to come back and re-record this part anyway. Um, I think the only thing I caught on the video was the 8.4, but I'm gonna go ahead, instead of posting two videos, I'm just gonna cover all of the examples um, in this video and just post one video, okay? Because um, I only recorded the second part when we were covering the example from 8.4. Um, and as we mentioned in class, because of the power um, cutting out a couple of times, we're just gonna, and it actually <laughs> was cutting out while I was in my office too. Yesterday was just a weird day. Um, but uh, we're gonna continue with 8.4 when we come back to class on Wednesday, okay? So for 8.3, this was, um, both of the sections, 8.3 and 8.4 were about trig. So in this first set, it's kind of like they give you trig functions and you have to take the integral of them, which most likely means you're going to have to use lots of identities, okay? Um, so in that note sheet that I gave you guys at the beginning of the semester, you do have quite a bit of identities. Um, on the other sheet, there was one that had like integrals, derivatives, and then the other sheet had the unit circle. It had all the relationships between sine and cosine. And it even had um, a lot of the trig identities, okay? So we'll be using those. And if you watch the video, you'll kind of get an idea of which ones we use the most, which are the power reducing formulas, also known as the double angle formulas or half angle formulas, depending on which version you're looking at. Um, and as well as the um, Pythagorean identities, okay? So there's a little like technique boxes inside the, um, the lecture notes, well, those will definitely be provided when you take the review and the test. Um, but for the most part, we're gonna start going on to work on example one. So with example one, it kind of like clued us in to what you had to be because of the radical, okay? So there's not really any identity that you're gonna be able to use that you can rewrite cosine as perfectly something perfectly squared um, therefore eliminating the square root at some point, it's just not going to happen. So since we're stuck with this cosine inside the radical, that is going to be our u, okay? So we're going to let u equal the cosine of five theta. Then I went ahead and I tried to figure out, well, what would du be? Because I'm going to have to substitute this, right? So the derivative of cosine is negative sine, and then the angle stays the same, but because the angle is not just a single variable like x or theta all by itself, we do have to take um, the chain rule of that. So we'll have to take the derivative of that angle, which happens to be five. And because we're taking the derivative with respect to theta, we do have a d theta in here. I just couldn't squeeze it in there, okay? Um, so if I simplify that, we can just basically put this constant multiplier in the front. It's negative five sine of five theta d theta. Now I do have a sine five theta. I went ahead and I split this so that it could be more easily identified. So sine cubed is sine squared times sine. Um, and then you can see that we have the sine five theta and we have the d theta. We just don't have this constant multiplier of negative five. So we divided both sides by negative five. And then we found that sine five theta d theta could be replaced by du over negative five. Whereas cosine of five theta could be replaced by u. However, we didn't have anything for this guy here, which is why he's double underlined, okay? We didn't know what to substitute for this. However, I do know that u involves cosine. So if I could rewrite this into cosines, then I can just plug in my u's, okay? And so we use the Pythagorean identity that sine squared plus cosine squared equals one, and we solved for sine squared by subtracting cosine squared to the other side. So now we have an expression to write instead of sine squared Five theta. Now we can write one minus cosine squared of five theta. And if you realize what the square means, right, it means the cosine of five theta is actually squared. And that right there is our u. 
So we get one minus u squared. This is another u and the radical becomes a one half exponent. And then this guy over here became the du over negative five. So I did take the division of negative five out as a constant multiplier of negative one fifth, okay? Then here we actually distributed the u to the one half. So we got u to the one half. If you add these exponents, you get u to the five halves. Then we took the integral of those using our power rule. Then eventually we distributed back in the negative one fifth. And of course, because there were no bounds, as soon as you applied the integral rules, you had to put plus c. So I brought my plus c downward. And then again, our problem was given to us in thetas, not u's. So we had to do the back substitution. So we plugged in what u was. We plugged in what u was here. And this is it. And if you really, really wanted to, you could write that as cosine to the three halves of five theta plus two over 35 cosine to the seven halves of five theta. Okay. Either way, both of these versions are the same thing. So they're both um, correct uh, expression for the answer. Okay. So that was the first example. I'll leave it here if you want to pause it and look over it a little bit more. Um, and then you can resume the video when you're ready for the next one. So for example two, this was Wallace's formula. And so I wrote down Wallace's formula here. On the test, you're only given this, but it does tell you that this Wallace formula is the exact same for sine. You literally just replace this with sine and it's the same two formulas for whether the exponent is even or whether the exponent is odd. So if the exponent is odd, you're using this um, expression here. And if the exponent is even, then you're using this expression there, okay? It just depends on the exponent. Since I am going from zero to pi halves, just like the Wallace's formula, and I do have cosine with an odd exponent. It's not written like this, but it is the same, their equivalent, okay? So in here, my exponent in is seven, which is odd. So I should be using this expression here that I circled. And then notice that you stop at n minus one over n. So when my denominator is seven, and I went ahead and calculated n minus one, which is seven minus one, which is six. And so that would be the numerator. So essentially we're just going up to this value because that is n minus one over n, okay? And so I only had those three there. I went ahead and reduced the fractions as much as I could and I got the answer 16 over 35, okay? Um, now, I can't remember specifically if Wallace's formula is on the test, um, but if it is, if you do have these bounds and just sine or cosine to a power, you can use Wallace's formula to make things easier for yourself, okay? You don't have to, and it won't specifically say to use Wallace's formula, but if you can identify that it's applicable and you can uh, apply it and get the answer, that's perfectly fine. There's other techniques and methods on how to integrate it. Um, and if the bounds are different, then you definitely have to integrate it. If there's no bounds at all, you cannot use Wallace's formula, okay? So just keep that in mind as we go. So example three we covered, um, and that one was pretty interesting because like, let me talk about how you could do problems differently um, and still end up with answers that might look different, but they are actually equivalent, okay? And so this one definitely helped me to do that. So the first version that we did was we said, let u equal tangent. And what made us realize that we could do it two different ways was the fact that if you had let u equal tangent, whatever it is, okay, I know my mind's a different angle, um, du would be secant squared theta. But if you also let u equal secant theta, then du would have been secant theta tangent theta. And if you notice, you have secant times secant, that's secant squared, and you have the tan. You also have the tan and the secant squared. So really, it wouldn't have mattered whether you had let u equal tangent or whether you had let u equal secant. The problem is still doable in both ways, okay? And so for the first iteration of this problem, I went ahead and I chose u as tangent, okay? And then in the next one, you'll see u as 
secant, okay? And then I'll even show you how they were equivalent. So here we let u equal the tangent. We take the derivative of tangent, which is secant squared, kept our angle the same, but because the angle wasn't a single variable, you do have to apply the chain rule. So the derivative of x over 40 is just one over 40, and I was taking the derivative with respect to x, so that's why there's a dx here. Now we do have the secant squared x over 40, that's this guy, and we do have the dx, that's this guy. What we don't have is this one over 40. So I multiplied this equation both sides by 40, which gave me the equation 40 du equals secant squared x over 40 dx. So now I know exactly what to replace this guys with. Both of those guys together will become 40 du, which is here, okay? And then the tangent of x over 40 became the u. So I took my constant multiplier out of the integral. We integrated using the power rule. There's no bounds, so I did have to put my plus c when I applied the integration rules. Um, and then I reduced the 40 and the 2, and I got 20u squared. Then I replaced back what u was, which again can be written as tan squared instead of tangent of the angle squared. Okay, and so that was the answer that we got doing it this way. Okay, pretty short and simple, right? But it was that way for a reason, so we can get to this concept of alternative methods. Okay, so another solution would have been to do it the other way around. Okay. So instead of writing secant squared, I split the secant squared. I wrote secant times secant. Again, same angle, right? The tangent, I just left there. And this time we're letting u equal secant of x over 40. So for me to find du, I have to take the derivative. So the derivative of secant is secant tangent, same angle. But because those angles are not just x, I have to multiply by the derivative of that angle. And so the derivative of x over 40 is 1 over 40. Now I'm doing with respect to x, so I have my dx. Now I do have the secant tangent dx. What I don't have is this 1 over 40. So I multiplied both sides by 40. I got that 40 du equals secant tangent dx. So I replaced all of this stuff with the 40 du. I replaced that guy with the u. We ended up with the same exact expression as before. Everything's exactly the same. The only thing different is that u is not tangent this time. u is secant, right? So I ended up with secant squared. So the thing is, is like, how is this 20 secant squared x over 40 plus c equivalent to 20 tangent squared x over 40 plus c? So the question I wrote here, is this guy equal to this guy? Question mark. We don't know, okay? The big idea here is to understand that this C and this C are just constants. It doesn't tell you what it is. And they could be different from one another. And as a matter of fact, they are different from one another, okay? Um, they're not the same C. So I would not subtract C on both sides because I don't know what C is. And I don't know if this one's bigger or that one's bigger or any of that, okay? So we're just gonna worry about the expression part of it. So I chose to deal with this side and see if I can make it equivalent to that side. Remember that intrigue where you had to like work on one side and then see if you could make it look like the other one? So I did use a Pythagorean identity. We used that one plus tangent squared is equal to secant squared. And so then I replaced sec the secant squared here with one plus tangent squared of the same angle. I went ahead and distributed my 20. So I got 20 plus this. Now this is a constant and this is a constant. So when you add them together, you just get another constant. See what I mentioned? How the constants will be different. I don't know what that is, but it's apparently 20 more than this one, okay? Um, but those two are going to give you just some constant, which means these two things are equivalent to each other. So even though we did the same problem two different ways, and we ended up with what looked like two different answers, those answers are actually equivalent to each other, okay? So... That was a good one to talk about. Now this one's example four. So this one was a little bit different because it required not the Pythagorean identities, but it required um, the power reducing formulas, okay? So the first thing I did was is I separated it into two integrals. So the integral of sine squared x plus the integral of one. Then for this one, we had to use the power reducing formula. And this I kind of wrote over here because I said, well, look, it's sine squared plus one. Your brain wants to say, well, let u equal sine. 
But when you do the derivative, you get cosine dx, and there ain't no cosine dx in there, so we can't do the substitution that way, okay? So instead, we use this formula, the power of reducing formula. So instead of writing sine squared x, we wrote one minus cosine double of that angle over two, okay? And this one I went ahead and integrated because it was just the integral of one, which is x, and then your bounds. Here though, I brought out the denominator as one half, and so I just have to integrate these two terms. Over here, I went ahead and evaluated the x of the two values, and I ended up with six pi. Here, I integrated them separately. So the integral of one and then the integral minus the integral of cosine two x, okay? The integral of one, we've already done this and we know that it ends up with six pi. So you've got six pi inside these brackets and then the six pi outside the bracket. For here though, we let u equal two x, then du would be two dx. I've got the dx, but not the two. So I divided both sides by two. And so I'm gonna replace my dx with du over two. So dx becomes du over 2, 2x becomes the u. The integral of cosine u, well, actually I took this out to the front and I'm actually integrating cosine u and then just du. So the integral of cosine u du is sine u, but I have this negative one half in the front, okay? So then I went ahead and I distributed my one half back in. So, um, no, actually I replaced my u first. So u was 2x, then I distributed the one half. So half of six pi is three pi. That would make negative one fourth. I'm gonna plug in my three pi and negative three pi to evaluate this. So two times three pi is the six pi, two times negative three pi is negative six pi. And then this plus six pi came down. When I typed each of these expressions in the calculator or I used my unit circle, actually, I went around you know, three whole unit circles making six pi, and then I went the opposite direction to get the negative six pi. But in any rate, I'm taking the y value of this spot right here, which is zero and zero, okay? So one fourth times zero is zero. So you're really just computing three pi plus six pi, which is nine pi, okay? And that was how we ended up with that result there. Now, this was the one where I did record, but I'm just gonna kind of go over it again, okay? Um, so for this one, it was the 8.4. 8.4 was about trig substitution. So this means that we're integrating expressions that don't have trig in them, but then we're going to make it turn into a trig problem, okay? Um, and so then we just basically had to identify which case we had. Since we had the constant minus the variables, we knew that that was case one. And according to case one, it had like A, U, and then a squared minus u squared. However, we identified what a is, and a is a squared is nine, which means that a itself is three. And here, u squared is x squared, which means u itself is just x. So then instead of writing a here, I wrote the value three. Instead of writing u here, I wrote the value x. And instead of writing a squared minus u squared, I wrote nine minus x squared. Okay, so that we have all the quantities that we have here for our values. Now it tells us in case one that you're going to let x equal three sine theta. So then if I, and it also even tells you that this expression is equivalent to a cosine theta. So then my radical is going to be equal to three because a is three cosine theta. So I have an expression for the radical and I have an expression for x. That takes care of these two guys, but not the dx. So I do have to use this expression for x to figure out what dx is. So the derivative of three sine x is three cosine or three sine theta is three cosine theta d theta. So now I have all the pieces. So we replaced the numerator, the radical with three cosine theta, replaced the denominator x with three sine theta, and then we replaced dx with three cosine theta d theta. These three cancel, and I brought this other three in the numerator to the front, but then I end up with cosine squared over sine, okay? And so I did convert this into sines. So again, the Pythagorean theorem, I just subtracted sine squared on both sides. So I got one minus sine squared theta for cosine squared theta, not for the number four, but F-O-R, cosine squared, right? So we replace cosine squared theta with the one minus sine squared theta. Then since you have these two terms over the fraction, I just split the fraction. 
So this term over the denominator minus that term over the denominator. Well, this is actually cosecant and this is actually just one sign, right? One of the signs cancel and you just end up with sign. Then I split the integral into two separate integrals. So that three multiplier does apply to both, which is why I have a bracket there. So I'm doing the integral of cosecant theta d theta minus the integral of sine theta d theta. I looked on my integral chart. We found the integral of this. It's negative ln cosecant theta plus cotangent theta inside the absolute value bars. And then I have a minus and the integral of sine theta is negative cosine theta. So those two negatives actually turn to plus cosine theta. Everything else stayed the same. Because I did apply my integral rules and there are no bounds to this problem, um, we do have to put the plus C in the same step that we apply the integral rules, okay? And then it just kind of carries on down. So then the weird part is the back sub. So we had to remember that for cosecant theta, that's when I have a triangle, that's opposite, or I'm sorry, hypotenuse over opposite. Cotangent would be adjacent over opposite. And cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse. And if you don't remember them, or if you can't keep them straight, sometimes like I doubt myself that I can keep them straight, um, you do have those on that reference sheet, okay? So that does tell you all of those relationships with respect to the triangle, okay? So then once I know these relationships, I'm going to refer back to that triangle. So if I go back up there, hypotenuse over opposite. Remember, this is the right angle, so across it is the hypotenuse, okay? So it's hypotenuse, and opposite means the opposite of the angle. So hypotenuse over opposite is three over x. Adjacent over opposite would be adjacent over the opposite, which is the square root of nine minus x squared over x. And then finally for this guy, adjacent over hypotenuse would be adjacent over hypotenuse. So the square root of nine minus x squared over three. Again, that's still all in bars with the three, right? So I go in ahead and I did two things. I distributed the three and I combined these two fractions into one fraction since they do have the same denominator. So those two numerators over one denominator x, and then I brought the three in there and then I multiplied over here by three, but the threes end up canceling, giving me just the radical of nine minus x squared. And of course we bring down our plus c. So this is the final answer, but sometimes with the LNs, they usually leave the coefficients as exponents. So this could also be your answer. However, I can't get rid of the bars because although um, the square root is going to be positive, and when I add three, that's going to be positive, this guy down here may not always be positive. And when I cube him, still, if it were a negative, it would still be a negative. So you cannot assume that this argument here is always going to be positive. So you have to leave those bars on it, okay? Only time you can get rid of the bars is if you know for a fact that what's inside will always stay positive. Um, but that's the end of this. Again, we're going to do more problems like this when we come back. I know I'm talking really fast. It's because I have a class coming up and I'm trying to get this done. Um, but if you need to slow down the video, uh, YouTube does have that option, right? To like slow it down a little bit or speed it up. Um, I can't imagine what I'm going to sound like speed it up. But anyway, um, you have everything here. And so if you need to pause the pages at any point or you need to uh, rewind it or anything like that, please do so. If you have any questions, let me know. We will continue 8.4 and then eventually move on into 8.5 and then 8.8. 8.5 and 8.8 .8 are not as heavy as these two sections. So we have a little bit of wiggle room to kind of push over into that, that day, okay? Um, but other than that, you guys have a good day and I hope this is helpful.